church family. Thanks for being here. My name is Dan. I'm the worship pastor for Foundations Windsor Campus. And it's a privilege to be here today. One church, multiple locations, one family. Uh, so let's, let me, as we step into worship today, let's come in as people on equal footing coming before God for the only thing, the thing that only God can provide, His kindness and His mercy. We all need that so we can sing that together. Amen.
your sin It's already been done You can add to His blood It was once for all The Father gave His Son
you have your communion cup, you can pull those out. If you did not get one on your way in, raise your hand. We have ushers who will bring you one. I see a hand down here, some few hands out. Uh, so we've got people grabbing those and they'll bring those in. Um, so yeah, this is, we get to take this together. And this is a symbol. This is something, it's a sacred symbol. Uh, and actually, to describe that further, we have hands up for communion. So real quick, just flash your hand if you've ever done a Pinewood Derby before. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah. I'm doing my first one with my son and my daughter uh, through Awana. And uh, actually I actually have a picture of the cars I think that we can show. Yeah, there we go. Uh, my son's is a Star Wars fighter. My daughter just said she wanted Elsa. And so we went blue and sparkly and epoxied uh, a Lego Elsa on there. Uh, but you know, so these cars, they're wooden. They just are uh, powered by gravity, but they symbolize, you know, what we know to be real cars, right? Uh, we still have a hand up here, by the way, if we can get yeah, right up there. Um, okay, it's coming, great. Uh, you know, they symbolize bigger cars, right? With real engines and real power. Uh, but they symbolize something more than that for us. What they symbolize is a connection. Uh, you know, kids come and say, hey, can we do this together, Dad? And the answer is a no-brainer. It's of course, right? We get to I just have been loving this time with them. And that's what we're symbolizing here. This is a meal, a symbol of a meal. And you might look at this and be like, how on earth is this a meal? Uh, and we call it the bread and the cup, but it symbolizes a meal that Jesus had with his disciples on the night he was betrayed. Uh, and he told them, you know, this is my body broken for you. This is my, the cup of the new covenant. Uh, do this as often as you eat in remembrance of me. But it symbolizes something more than just that meal, right? It symbolizes a heavenly father, a triune God, doing what it took to do what we could not do to bring us into the family. And so as Jesus' body was broken for us, and it was, it was not just broken on the cross, it was broken before he went to the cross within inches of his life. As his blood was spilled, he made a way. And so this is our home base to remember this, to remember that this was bought at a price and then freely offered to us to follow him in gratitude. So if you're a follower of Jesus, or today you wanna to take that step to follow him, uh, this is for you. Uh, and if you're not sure yet, it's okay. You don't have to believe to belong here. We're glad you're here. But this symbol, this is a sacred symbol for us to remember and to reorient ourselves at home base of what Jesus did at the cross. So let's take this bread. This is Jesus' body broken for us that we might have life. Let's take it. And then he took the cup and this red drink, which so easily symbolizes the blood that he shed for us. He also says the cup of the new covenant, a new way for our relationship with God to be mediated. No longer would our relationship with God go through another human man or a list of rules, but rather God's spirit would come to live inside of us and we would have direct access to God in Jesus' name. And that's because of what Jesus did at the cross. So in gratitude and in remembrance, let's drink this, the cup of the new covenant. One more song, and it's, it goes perfectly with this home base of the grace of God, the amazing grace of God to meet us in our sin, in our brokenness, and call us into new life. So let's stand and let's respond. Would you sing this with me?
are on you and we thank you for this grace we thank you for your kindness and your compassion would you bless us help us to be obedient to be faithful and to trust in you it's in Jesus name we pray amen amen and thank you again for being here we just have a few quick announcements we move on. Uh, if you're new, if today's your first time, would you text new to the number on the screen? It's not so that we can spam you. We're going to send you some opportunities to get connected, build some relationships here. Uh, and so yeah, please uh, text that if you have any questions. Uh, we have Easter coming up in two weeks. Big deal. But yeah, we're so excited. And obviously, it's a highlight of the year always. We have a lot of services. Uh, you don't have to register them for or anything, but on our website, we're going to have a graphic that uh, shows which services we expect to be the most highly attended. And you can use that if you are able to, to find a service that's maybe a little lower attendance. We think your experience is going to be better. It's going to help make space in the parking lot for first time guests. Uh, but mostly we would just love to see you at Easter. And if you know anybody that doesn't have a church home for Easter, whether it's a coworker, a friend, a neighbor, uh, somebody who maybe doesn't know the good news of Jesus, we have invite cards out on the tables just outside these doors. You can grab them on your way out uh, and invite someone to say, hey, this means the world to me and we'd love to have you there to see what it's about. So with that, please turn and greet your neighbor, shake their hand, catch their name, and then have a seat.
a gift to be here with you guys. My name is Brandon, and I'm the family pastor here at Foundations. And uh, we've been in a series, uh, Gospel Controversy, and we hit on some heavy topics. Uh, we are shifting gears um, today, and we're going to be talking about the good life for the next two weeks leading up to Easter. And uh, I'm just excited to, to enter in that. Today, we're going to be talking about snakes. We're going to be talking about gates. We're going to be talking about the court system and how all that connects to the good life. Now, when I say good life, um, you probably have some images that come to mind, um, some categories that fit. And so I have some categories up here on the screen of what consists of the good life, right? Uh, the first bucket is relationships. That's friendships, uh, family, uh, spouse, kids, right? Uh, the next bucket is career, doing things that you love in your sweet spot, uh, personal growth. I want to grow emotionally, physically, mentally. Uh, the next category is happiness, the pursuit of happiness. I want to do adventure. I want to enjoy life, right? Uh, the next bucket is spirituality and religion. And then finally, doing good, right? And, and we look at that list and we go, okay, yeah, if, if we are thriving in these areas, we have the good life. But I'm here to tell you today that I think that our approach sometimes is misguided and we are missing it. Uh, one, one of the first times that I, I felt like I arrived at the good life, it was 2014 and newly married. And uh, so really excited. Um, if you did the math real quick, yes, this year is our 10 year anniversary. So, so excited for that. What, what? Yes, come on. Um, we're making it. Um, so uh, we got married and super excited. Um, we found a little place off Federal in Denver, and uh, we had this apartment, super excited. Now, to, I just want you to know kind of where we were at. When I got married, um, I had a whopping $23 in my bank account. <laughs> yeah, I know, Daddy Warbucks over here. Um, my, my wife married up for sure, yeah, definitely. Um, so, so we got married and we were so excited because we found this place that we can make our own, our little slice of heaven. And, uh, and so we moved in and we saw, started to settle in and uh, quickly, the shine of the good life started to wear off. <laughs> uh, we, we had like a three inch gap under our front door, um, which was really nice because we were able to heat outside um, constantly, which was really good. Um, and our neighbors smoked a lot of weed. Um, and so it gave a really nice aroma during dinner. Um, and so we really enjoyed that. Um, and then uh, at our apartment complex, we had plenty of issues with uh, our appliances, like things would go wrong, things would stop working. Um, the nice thing about renting is like, that's on them, not you, you know, so that's kind of cool. Um, but the property ma management company was really slow to the game. And so it would just take forever. You fill out the request and, and, uh, and it would just take a long time. Um, not only that, our marriage, um, you know, you have the honeymoon phase. Things are great, amazing, woo, this is the best. And then you realize, oh, wow, okay, this is totally different. And I don't agree with you and you're getting on my nerves. And, and, uh, and all of that started um, to, to reveal itself. Now, one of the, the great perks about where we lived um, was it had a pool, which, you know, you're like, hey, this has access to a pool, this is amazing. Um, but the pool that, that we had access to, and when we signed up, we were, we were so, so excited to have this pool, um, was kind of like I-25. It was constantly under construction. It was never open. It was so frustrating. Um, but one day it was actually open. So the stars aligned, the weather was nice, the pool was open, and this is like a motel pool. Um, this isn't like the one in Rain Dance that you're just like, this is insane. Um, and it's packed, right? Because it's open and everyone from the apartment complex is there. And so we're swimming, we're having a good time, enjoying the nice weather. And I look over and there's this man and he is walking into the shallow end of the pool. And I kid you not, he has a 10 foot boa constrictor around his neck and I'm like no thanks peace out I am out I'm like Indiana Jones I hate snakes I'm not about to swim in this pool with a 10 foot snake hanging out over there and so I peace out and and the reason why I share that is it is so often we chase this a good life what we think is the good life, oh, it's a great, it's the apartment we've wanted, it has a pool, and quickly the good life starts to fade. It, it, it's like water that we're trying to carry with our hands and it just slips through and, and we can't continue to carry it. And maybe you've experienced that before, you, you've bought a home and how quickly we fill it up with stuff. And then we're like, 
We need another house with, or maybe a storage shed, and, and we need a new house with maybe some more bedrooms, and, and how quickly we realize that there's cracks and there's issues, and, and what we have maybe isn't what we're looking for. We, do, we have that with relationships. You have someone who is broken and another person who is broken, and you're like, you're my soulmate, and I love you, and I'm going to find worth and value in you, and you put these two broken people together and it works out perfectly and there's never any issues. No, I'm just, I'm just kidding. No, it, it is hard and challenging and difficult and you see all of the plot flaws with the person that you're with and, and you have to learn how to navigate that relationship. We, we see it time and time again. If I could just have that dream job, dream car, I go on that dream vacation and it's, it's what I've always expe- like hoped for and it's amazing. And then you get back and you're like, I need a vacation from my vacation because I'm tired from it. We chase this ever elusive good life. We, we want it, we want to experience the good life and we're trying to, to make that happen. And sometimes we even try to do that with religion. If I, if I come to church, if I check the boxes, if I, if I give, if I serve, if I show up weekly, that's, I'm going to be in the good life. That's how I'm going to have the good life. And yet, it doesn't come through again. If I can be a good person, I've seen people give their lives to good causes. And then they get into the weeds of it and they're like, this is different than what I expected. We chase this good life. Can it be possible Can we have the good life? Have you experienced the good life? Do you know what that's like? I'm here to tell you today that the good life is possible. In fact, it is promised and it can be realized. And Jesus is gonna tell us how. So we're gonna open up there in John chapter 10. So if you brought your Bibles, I would encourage you guys to open up. But before I read, I wanna share little context. I think it's important for us as we're reading scripture. I love the YouVersion Bible app. It's so awesome. They have the verse of the day. Uh, you'll see stuff in social media where they post a verse or, or they highlight on some things. And, and, it's, and it's good. The verses are good. It's God's word. Um, but a lot of times we can pull that out of context and we don't really have a clear picture of what is going on. And, and a lot of the Bible, um, it kind of builds on itself. And so we're going to be in chapter 10, but I want you to have an understanding of what happened in chapter 9 because it sets up what takes place in chapter 10. So in chapter 9, we have this blind man, blind from birth, and Jesus heals the blind man. Physically, can't see, now he can see. And not only has he been changed because he can now see, but he had a real encounter with Jesus. And so he's telling everyone, hey, I was blind and now I see, look what Jesus has done for me. And he's telling all of these people of the miraculous work that took place. And so he finds himself in the, the synagogue and the religious leaders hear about this and they're asking him questions and they're investigating and they're going, who healed you? And he's like, Jesus healed me. And they find out that he was healed on the Sabbath. And the Pharisees are upset. They're bothered. They, they want to trap Jesus. They're, they're frustrated by Jesus healing this blind man. Can you believe him on the Sabbath? He's not following the rules. And so they shame this guy. They shame his family. And they say, you can't be in the synagogue anymore. What's crazy is these Pharisees, these religious leaders of the day, they cared more about the rules than the fact that this guy was blind and now he could see. And Jesus catches wind of this and he goes and he approaches the Pharisees and he has a dialogue, he has a conversation. And what's beautiful is there's this stark contrast between Jesus as a leader and the religious leaders of the day. And you're gonna see a difference there. So we're in John chapter 10. We're gonna start in verse one. It says this, I tell you the truth. And he says this, and he says it a couple more times in this passage. And anytime you see, I tell you the truth, or some versions say, truly, truly, or very, very truly, um, Jesus is saying, what I'm about to say carries a lot of weight and is really important. So listen in, lean in, okay? So I tell you the truth, anyone who sneaks over the wall of the sheepfold rather than going through the gate must surely be a thief and a robber. But the one who enters through the gate or through the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him and the sheep recognize his voice and come to him. He calls his own sheep by name and he leads them out. 
After he has gathered his own flocks, he walks ahead of them and they follow him because they know his voice. They won't follow a stranger. They will run from him because they don't know his voice. Those who heard Jesus use this illustration didn't understand what he meant. So Jesus approaches the religious leaders of the day and he does something really cool here. And we're gonna see this in the text today is he incrementally, little by little, reveals a little bit more about who he is. Right now he uses this uh, pretty broad stroke, generic uh, example of who he is and then he gets more and more and more specific, which is what God does uh, throughout time. He's going, hey, this is who I am and he continues to reveal himself to us. He doesn't just give it all right away. We, we experience him little by little, more and more. In fact, this is a, a, a pattern um, that is taking place um, throughout the book of John. We, we see Jesus perform a miracle and then he follows it with a discourse. And so he approaches the Pharisees and he uses this example, this sermon illustration of sheep and shepherds, which to us today is maybe a little unfamiliar. To them, they would have known exactly what he was talking about. They would have gone, oh yeah, of course, well, duh. Yeah, they, the sheep follow the shepherd and they follow his voice and uh, yeah, oh, all that stuff makes sense, but they didn't understand the connection. Like, what are you trying to say, Jesus? I, I don't get what you're, what you're trying to tell us here. And so he continues to reveal himself here in verse seven. So he explained to them, I tell you the truth, I am the gate for the sheep. All who come before me were thieves and robbers, but the true sheep did not listen to them. Yes, I am the gate. Those who come in through me will be saved. They will come in and they will go freely and they will find good pasture. The thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. My purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. So Jesus starts out and he says, I'm the gate. Which when I read that, I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, I don't understand. Do you guys understand? Like, what is the gate? Well, there's this scholar. His name was Sir George Adam Smith. And he traveled to the uh, Near East. Um, and he was around shepherds trying to learn. He was like, well, I, I just want to learn. Like, how, how does this work? And uh, he was with this shepherd. And the shepherd was explaining, hey, this is where we take them. And this is where they graze. And, and this is where we keep them at night. And oftentimes... They would create four walls um, for the, shapes, the, the sheep to be um, uh, you know, safe at night with an opening for the sheep to come in. And, and these, these four walls were you know, rocks and uh, debris and whatever they could find um, to create kind of an enclosure for the sheep to come in. Um, well, he was a little confused. He was like, I, I see that. That makes sense. But like, where's the gate? Where's the thing that like closes to keep the, the sheep in there. You know, mo most of pens and stuff, my, my father-in-law is, is a rancher and, you know, you shut the pen, make sure the gate's closed, right? And you want to keep them in there safe. Uh, well, there was no gate. And so the shepherd explained, I am the gate. When the sheep come in, they lay down and they sleep for the night and, and they're, they're taken care of and, and uh, they're under my care and protection. I lay down in the opening, I am the gate. No sheep gets out, but through me. And no wolf comes in, but over me, through me. There's no way. And Jesus is saying, I'm the gate. There's this entry point. There's this access to safety in my, in, in, under my care, under my protection, and it's found in me. It's through me. And I care for my sheep. I love my sheep. They have value. They have worth. I care about them. Come in, be safe, be saved. I lay down my life to protect my sheep, which is giving us a little picture of what he's about to do on the cross for you and for me. It's beautiful. He is the gate. In verse nine, he says, I am the gate. Those who come in through me will be saved. There's this safety, there's this protection. There's this entry point into what the good life looks like. They will come in and they will go freely and they will find good pasture. Jesus is saying, you want to have the good life? There's one entry point and that's through me. In fact, if you're taking notes, I want you guys to write this down. The good life is found in Jesus. The good life is found in Jesus and Jesus alone. 
That's how we experience the good life. If we want to find rest for our souls, if we want to experience all that life has for us. In fact, in verse 10, it's kind of the, 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 the biggest moment in this scripture where he goes, the thief comes to steal and kill and destroy, but I have come that you might have life and life to the fullest or a rich and satisfying life, the good life. Jesus has come so that we can experience that. And the way that we find that is through him and him alone. The good life is found in Jesus. He is the gate. Now he continues in verse 11 to reveal a little bit more. And he uses another uh, illustration. He says, I am the good shepherd. So not only is he the gate, the entry point to salvation, he is the good shepherd. And the good shepherd sacrifices his life for the sheep. A hired hand will run when he sees a wolf coming and he will abandon the sheep because they don't belong to him and he isn't their shepherd. And the wolf comes and attacks them and scatters the flock. The hired hand runs away because he is working only for the money and doesn't really care about the sheep. Jesus is contrasting himself. Shots fired at the religious leaders of the day saying, y'all are a bunch of hired hands. You actually don't care about the sheep but I have come because I care about the sheep and I care about the sheep deeply. I am the good shepherd. The hired hand doesn't have a vested interest in the sheep where the shepherd on the other hand cares deeply about the well-being of the sheep. Like I want you to thrive, I want you to do well, I want you to experience the good life. The shepherd cares about that. And what's beautiful, and I don't know who needs to hear this today, but I want you to lean in. The good shepherd Jesus values you. He values you, not because of what you've accomplished, not because of the rules that you follow, not because of all of the box you've checked or your, all of the things, the stripes on you, all of the amazing stuff that you think is great about you and you want the approval of other people. Jesus doesn't see, he sees you as valuable because he is, you are his sheep and he loves you and he cares about you. And he has an interest in you. You are his son. You are his daughter. He wants relationship with you. The hired hands, on the other hand, that doesn't matter. I'm going to lead you and manipulate you because it's going to make me look good. Jesus, on the other hand, goes, no, I care about you. And I want you to thrive. And I want you to find, a f I want you to flourish. And we do that through Jesus. Verse 14, he continues and he says this. I'm the good shepherd. I know my own sheep and they know me. Look at that, it's beautiful. This is the intimacy there. Just as my father knows me and I know my father, I sacrifice my life for the sheep. He's continued to say that over and over and over again. I'm the gate, I lay down my life. I'm the good shepherd, I sacrifice for my sheep. Verse 17 says this. It's coming. Okay, the Father loves me because I sacrificed my life so that I might take it back again. No one can take it from my life from me. I sacrifice it voluntarily. For I have the authority to lay it down when I want to and also to take it up again. For this is what my Father has commanded. Jesus is saying, I am the good shepherd. I lay down my life for my sheep. And the way that we find the good life is spending time in intimacy with him, getting to know him, listening to his voice. In fact, I want you guys to write this down. The good life is found in Jesus, and this is accomplished by listening to his voice, getting to know him, spending time in his presence, knowing who Jesus is. And we do that through reading his word and prayer and community and worship and all of these beautiful things. We get to know who Jesus is. If we want to have the good life, it is found in him and him alone. And the only way that we find that is by listening to the voice of the good shepherd. There's this man in Australia. And uh, he was a shepherd. And he was accused of stealing sheep. And uh, he was not only accused, he was charged of it. And he was saying, no, these are actually my sheep. They've been missing for a couple days. And so it went to court. And the judge wasn't really sure what to do. Like, ah, I'm puzzled. And then he had this idea. Hey, I'm going to bring in the plaintiff, and we'll bring in the sheep. And you go over there, and you're going to call the sheep. So the plaintiff goes over, and is like, 
Ooh, sheep, come here. You know, like, shoot, come on, come on. And, uh, and the sheep froze and was startled and was like, ah, I'm not going over there. Well, the defendant, it was now his turn. And he made a distinct call. I, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I just made that up. Um, but the sheep ran. The sheep ran to him because he recognized the voice of his master. Do you know the voice of the good shepherd? Do you know the voice of Jesus? Have you spent time in his presence, hearing his voice, following his leading? Because he is the very best. In fact, if we go back, we saw that he, when we're under his care and protection, he leads us to good pastures. He leads us through the valley of the shadow of death. He is worthy. And so when we spend time listening to Jesus, oh, it's beautiful and it's amazing. And I think sometimes we think following Jesus is going to cramp my style. Like it's going to restrict me and I'm not going to be able to do all these things. But Jesus says they come and they go as they please and they have good pasture there's this freedom in following Jesus. When I think sometimes we think it's restrictive, it's this beautiful relationship of encountering him and spending time in his presence, following and listening to the voice of the good shepherd. D.L. Moody, he um, started the Moody Bible Institute. Um, he had a friend that went to the East and uh, was looking for a shepherd that was still in the practice of calling sheep by name. Back in Jesus' day, uh, they would call sheep by name very regularly. Um, today, that's not a very common practice. And so he found this shepherd. He wanted to learn from him. And so he came to the shepherd, and he had an idea. He was like, oh, can I borrow your cloak and your staff and give me some of their names? I want to see if they'll come to me. So he puts on the cloak, and he has the staff. And he's like, what's the name? And he's like, Mina. I was like, okay, cool. Hey, Mina, Mina, come here. The flock, peace out. They run. They're like, no, thank you. They run away. And the guy's kind of disappointed because he's like, oh, I, was just, I thought that would work. I kind of smelled like the shepherd, looked like the shepherd. They didn't come to me. And so disappointed, he goes back to the shepherd and he says, hey, will, will none of them come? Will none of them listen to my voice? Will none of them follow me? And he goes, no, some will. The sick sheep will follow anybody. The sick sheep will follow any voice. And here's the deal. There's so many voices out there that are saying, this is the good life, and it's whispering to us, hey, hey, come follow this. If, if you just get this, if you just do this, if, if we can make it look this way, you will find life and life to the fullest, and it will satisfy you. And we chase these other voices as the voice of Jesus gets more and more distant. And we, we run. And I, there are six sheep here. Just, th there are. That have been following so many other voices, listening to the good life, trying to find it in so many other areas. I, I mean, I, what's crazy is we live in a day and age where we have access to so many things. The good life as it's built. We have so many material. Hey, you feeling like Mexican food or Thai food today? You know, like we have access to so many things, clothes, technology. And yet depression and in, in, um, <clears throat> mental health is skyrocketing. Escapism is an all-time high. People clock out. They go home. You just binge watch your shows. And you're just going, drudging through life, indulging in so many different things. I'm, I'm just going to endlessly scroll on social media, trying to find, looking for what the good life has to offer to me. And we listen to so many other voices, the thief that comes to steal and kill and destroy, whispering to us saying, hey, come check this out. This will meet your need. Come be a part of my flock. It's so much better. And we follow these other voices rather than the voice of the good shepherd, the one who calls us and says, follow me. And what's beautiful about who Jesus is, is if that's you today and you're sitting here like, oh, I do feel kind of sick. And I have followed all of these other things and it feels like I've chased this good life and it just continues to evaporate in front of me. Jesus stands here 
not condemning, but with open arms as the gate saying, come home. This gate is open. I want you to be a part of my flock, be a part of my sheepfold. You have value, you have worth. And yes, you're hurt and you're broken and you're walking with a limp and Jesus is going, come to me. I will bring you healing and restoration for your soul. And I will show you and lead you to what the good life is looks like and has to offer. It is found in Jesus and it is found by listening to his voice. And maybe you're sitting here today and you're like, I don't know about that. I want to read the scripture one more time and just ask you, is this someone worth following? I'm going to be in verse 14. It says this, I'm the good shepherd. I know my own sheep and they know me. It's beautiful relationship, intimacy. God knows everything about you. And at the core of who we are, so many of us, we just want to fit in. We want to belong. We want to be known. And Jesus knows us, and we can know him. Just as my father knows me, and I know my father, so I sacrifice my life for the sheep. He's talking about he's going to die. He's going to lay down his life for you and for me. I have other sheep too that are not in this sheep fold. This is a beautiful moment. I must bring them in also. He's talking to a Jewish audience saying, if you follow me and you're a part of my sheep, beautiful, that's amazing. But he is cluing them into what's about to take place saying, me, I now have the opportunity to experience the good life found in Jesus. There's Jewish people and there's Gentiles, which pretty much means everyone else. And Jesus is saying, I'm about to expand who can be a part of my sheepfold. It doesn't matter what race you are. It doesn't matter what you look like. You can have the good life found in Jesus. And he's talking about us, which I think is so cool. I must bring them in. He wants us a part of his flock. They will listen to my voice and they will be one flock with one shepherd, that being Jesus. The father loves me because I sacrifice my life so that I might take it back up again. No one can take my life from me. And they tried. They tried over and over and over again, devising plans to try, and then Jesus would escape. Jesus goes, I know my time, and I'm gonna follow the will of my Father, and when it's time, I'm gonna lay it down. And it's not gonna be the Jewish people. It's not gonna be the religious leaders of the day. It's not gonna be the Romans that nailed me to that cross. It is gonna be of my own accord that I willingly lay down my life for you and for me. For I have the authority to lay it down when I want to and also to take it up again. A lot of messiahs, a lot of voices said, hey, I, I'm gonna die and I'm gonna predict my death. Jesus is the only one to predict his death and resurrection and pull it off. He has the power to pick it up again, saying, I'm gonna die, but I'm gonna die on my own terms and then I'm going to rise, and we're going to celebrate that a couple, day, uh, a couple weeks from now, being Easter. For this is what the Father has commanded. Is that someone we want to follow? The good life we have access to, it's right in front of us. All we have to do is say yes and listen to his voice. The next couple of verses show that the people listening were divided. There were people that were like, this guy is demons in him. We don't believe him. Then others were like, no, he's legit. We believe in him. And we have that decision right now today to go, is, is this true? Is the good life found in Jesus or not? And some people will say yes, and others will say no. And Jesus stands there saying, come, come home. I have a better way for you, the best way. Come follow me. Learn from me. I will teach you what it's like to thrive and to live. I, uh, when we surrender to Jesus and we listen to his voice and we lean into all that he has for us, he, he does something that's incredible. Changes our outlook on everything. So I want you guys to check this out. Earlier we had this up. But the good life is found in Jesus because Jesus reframes and redeems our relationships. There is goodness in relationships. Jesus created relationships. In Genesis, it's not good that man be alone and he created a helper. Like we are wired for community. That is a very good thing. 
But if we're hoping that that person, that friendship, that spouse fills that void inside of us, it won't. But when we're filled with Jesus and what he offers and listen to his voice and find his good, the good life in him, it changes our interactions. It takes our brokenness and we begin to experience healing and restoration. We learn how to have conversations and how to forgive someone and how to truly love when we're following Jesus and it strengthens our relationships and those around us. Jesus gives us our career new purpose. And if you guys know this, but when he created man, he said, get to work. You're wired to do something. Like we, our God is a creator and in his image, we are to be creators. We're to make things, we're to accomplish things. We are called to do things, but we've, when we find our worth and our value and trying to find the good life in our career, it's gonna leave us wanting. But when you find it in Jesus, we have a new purpose in our career. We have a new mission. We have a new reason to thrive and to be the best employee that we can possibly be and to achieve for his glory. Jesus deepens our personal growth and brings us to maturity. When we surrender to Jesus and we experience the good life in him, we grow physically. He cares about our bodies and how we take care of ourselves he cares about our mental health and we can grow in our mentality and, and we can grow emotionally and we can grow in all of these areas and find maturity and wholeness and sanctification because of who Jesus is and what he's called us to do. We can grow in those areas. Jesus is the source of pure joy and deep happiness. When we trace that the happiness, the pursuit of happiness. We just want to be happy and chase adventure and do all these fun things and, and post it on social media. We can chase those things and we can have moments that are just really happy and good. But what happens when, as life hits, things, you get that phone call or you have that meeting in the doctor's office and things are falling apart all around you and life hits. When we follow Jesus, our hope of the good life is not found in our happiness, but in him. And we can have deep joy. In fact, the book of James says, count it all joy, my brothers, when you face trials of many kinds. You can have joy. You can have happiness. You can have purpose, even in the midst of really hard things. Because Jesus is steady through all of it. And we can find the good life in him. Next, Jesus redefines our spirituality by a relationship with him, not a religious system. Who's bucking against the religious system of the day that put these impossible standards on the people. You gotta follow these rules and you gotta do all these things. And Jesus is going, you know what you gotta do? You gotta spend time with me. You gotta hear my voice. You gotta be a part of my sheep. And when you do, it's beautiful and it's amazing and I take care of you and I, I, I help you find nourishment for your soul. We, it, it transforms from a religion to a relationship with God. Lastly, Jesus provides us the ultimate reason for doing good and laying down our life for others as he was the prime example of that. Laying down his life on the cross for you and for me, continually laying down his life for his disciples, sacrificing for them, being the gate, being the good shepherd, and now we're not just doing good just to do good. We're doing good on behalf of God and we're following in his footsteps and it has an eternal impact. It doesn't just feed a belly for a day. It can feed a soul for all of eternity. We can do the ultimate good because of what God has called us to. When we surrender to him, when we follow his leading, we can taste and see the good life. And that comes from listening to his voice. I'll be honest with you guys. Um, I'm in Rooted. I'm doing, I have a Rooted group. Some of our Rooted people are probably in here. Love my group. They're amazing. And um, I hate to admit this, but um, this week I, I was working on the message. I was working on stuff for work. And um, I just got distracted and I wasn't spending time with the Lord this week. Um, I got to Saturday and I had zero of my days done. 
And I felt really guilty because I'm like, I'm about to get on the stage and like talk about spending time with, the, you know, the voice of God, like God wants to be with me and I'm not doing it. Like, oh man, so I felt bad. So I, I sat down on Saturday and I started working through um, my rooted devotional and I did day one and uh, it was fine. I um, did day two and it was fine. And I did day three and something clicked. There was something that happened. And it, it wasn't the material that hit me. It was like the scripture and the presence of God, like his peace washed over me. Throughout this week, I've, I've had kind of a sour attitude and, and uh, like kind of a poor perspective on life. And, and in that moment, like God met me as I was listening to his voice and it changed my entire outlook on the day. And it's, it's led into today. And I like, even though things aren't perfect, I feel like I was tasting the good life. And God wants to meet with you. He's a good shepherd. And he's saying, come, be a part of my flock. So we're going to get really practical of what that can look like. And you've heard the things before, like, yeah, you need to read your Bible. Uh, you need to pray. You need to, yeah, those things are good. And I would encourage you to do those. But I want to give you three kind of specific examples of ways that we can listen to the voice of Jesus. Okay, the first one up here on the top is emotionally healthy um, spirituality, which if you've never read that book, it's a phenomenal book. I would encourage you guys to check it out. Um, it's beautiful. Um, but in that book, it talks about this practice of daily office. And uh, it's been a historic practice, practice for generations um, of meeting with God and what that looks like. How, how do we spend time with God? Because a lot of us are sitting here like, that sounds nice, but like, what does that look like? Um, they have a guide on their website um, that you can go to, and it'll walk you through what daily office looks like. And it's 5, 10, 15 minutes, whatever you can do um, in the morning, and then at lunch, and then during the dinner time. And, uh, and you spend time in his presence, and, uh, and it's really powerful. Um, if you're looking for any of these after, by the way, um, they're going to be on our app under the notes. Um, and if you're online, you'll see it in the notes section too. And so you can get links directly to that, which will make it a little easier for you guys. Um, but phenomenal thing. Um, the next one is dwell. And at the low price of twenty nine ninety nine a year, um, it, it, uh, it is worth it. I know it's $30, but um, this is the Bible. And yes, there's the YouVersion Bible app, which is free. And that's great. So if money's tight, like go that option because um, you can have it uh, re read to you. Um, but what's cool about dwell um, is it has a bunch of different um, scriptures and voices, and it's, it's purely the Bible. And so, like, what we'll do is uh, they, they have a section where it's like sleep to the sayings of Jesus. And so I'll click on that one, and it's literally Jesus' words, whatever's underlined and read in the Bible or whatever, and I'll play it and put a sleep timer of like 15 minutes and just listen to the words of Jesus as I fall asleep at night. Um, when I'm driving, I'll, I'll listen to the Bible, or, or maybe when I'm getting ready for the day. Sometimes it's hard to sit down and literally open up and read the Bible, um, but having it read over you is, just, is really beautiful. A way to hear from God. And there's times where it'll just click and things will, will stand out to me and, and I'll hear from God. Um, the last one is Lectio 365. Um, it's from the practice of Lectio Divina, um, which has been around for a long time, um, but it's an app. And uh, this one's free, by the way, which is awesome. And uh, it has a morning and an evening um, devotional kind of thing that you'll click and you'll listen to. And uh, it'll guide you through like, okay, take a deep breath right now. Okay, we're going to focus on Jesus. We're going to let the worries of the day go away, and we're going we're gonna to focus on him right now. What's cool about it is I'll, I'll do it when I wake up to, to focus on Jesus for the day, um, and then as I go to bed, um, all of the stuff that happened during the day, all of the difficult moments, I can just lay them at the feet of Jesus as I go and I rest and I spend time in his presence as I go into sleep. And so I uh, just encourage you guys, check those out. Um, but you don't have to do those. You can do what, what works for you. You can open up your Bible if you, if you want to do that. Do the soap method. Uh, you want to do a prayer walk. Maybe you're in Windsor, and I, I've done this recently. You walk Windsor Lake, and it's beautiful. You have the lake and the mountains, and, and you don't have to say anything. You just, you just marvel at, at, wow, God, you are so amazing, and you just spend time listening and in his presence. Sometimes I think there's like these expectations and these standards. You have to do these things. But Jesus is saying, all I want is to come talk to me. Listen to my voice. Spend time in my presence. I have the very best thing for you. I have the good life for you. So I'd encourage you, don't let another day go by without spending time in the presence of the gate and of the good shepherd. 
And maybe you're sitting here today and, and this is your first time kind of hearing about these things and you've tried the good life. You've tried to, to do all of these things, to scratch that itch, to quench that thirst and you're thirsty again and you're let down and there's a lot of baggage and you're hearing about a better way, the best way, but you don't know what that looks like or where to even start. You can have a relationship with Jesus starting today. Jesus is saying, hey, you're sick, come to me. I've come for the sick. That's the reason why I'm here. The gate is wide open, come home. And I will lead you and guide you and feed you. I am the best way. So listen to my voice. So if you want to like follow Jesus, but don't know what that looks like, come talk to me. Anyone you see on the stage, we're gonna have a prayer team here um, in front and, or go to Next Steps and just have a conversation or, or friend who brought you and just go, I, I want that. What does that look like? What does that mean? How, how do I have a relationship with Jesus? I want the good life. Show me the way. I'm gonna close with praying and we're gonna move into a time of, of just thanking the good shepherd and saying a statement like, I'm gonna follow. Because sometimes with our voice, with our voice, we're declaring that we're gonna take steps in action to follow his voice and his leading. So let's pray. God, thank you for every single person who is here right now. Thank you for those who are engaging with us online. God, thank you that you are the very best thing and you left your throne and you stepped into our mess and our brokenness. You came for the sick. You came for the wounded. You understand our pain and what we're going through. And you know us. And you don't stand condemning. You stand with open arms saying, welcome home. Come back to me. Follow my leading. Follow my voice. The thief comes to steal and kill and destroy. And there's so many voices out there that are trying to pitch a better way. But God... Your way is the best way, and you are the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father but through you. You are the only access point to the good life. And so we thank you for that today. We choose you today. God, help us to cultivate a rhythm of spending time in your presence, listening to your voice, tuning our ears to the voice of the good shepherd. We want that. We want you. You are the very best. In your name we pray. Amen. We're going to close in song together. So if we stand, we're just going to take this message and respond in faith. Jesus together. Uh, 
pray that you go and you're able to take one step of faith to listen better to the shepherd's voice this week, not out of guilt, but out of gratitude and a sense of peace and wholeness that comes from Jesus. Grab the Easter invite cards on the way out uh, and have a great week. We'll see you next week.